Welcome back to the podcast. And this week's reviewer of the week is Morgan Step 13. And she says, five stars. I love this podcast. I'm not pregnant or a mom yet, but I still love listening to this podcast. And I find it really helpful to know this information so I can be fully educated when I do become pregnant. I love how you give lots of perspective and your voice is so soothing. Ha ha. <laughs> Keep up the great work. Um, I must have made a comment or joke about that recently because I am fully aware that my voice is not extremely soothing. So thank you, Morgan. <laughs> and I'm seriously, you guys, I am never more impressed um, than when I have a mom that's like, I'm not even pregnant yet that is on here and listening, stick with me. If that is you, I promise that you are in the right place and you're gonna hear the right things right here. Also, if you have topics that come to your mind because you are not pregnant yet and it's something that you wanna hear about, uh, send them my way because I'm definitely already talking to pregnant women and maybe there's something, a different perspective that you can offer and I love it. So please, please, please send it my way. This week, you guys, you know I'm creating this postpartum course. I'm crazy excited about it. It's in the works like every week, head down, working on it. We're talking about scripting like next week. And by the time this comes out, who knows, maybe it'll already be scripted, but um, I'm really excited. And this week's topic is one of those postpartum topics. There is a ton more information that will be within the postpartum course, but I thought this is so useful for moms right now whether you are pregnant or if you already have your baby, this is going to be really helpful information for you to hear right now. So I want to talk today about baby sleep, kind of what's normal, baby sleep schedules, a couple of questions in between, that kind of stuff, because I think it's actually going to be a really great benefit to everybody listening. So let's dive in. Let's talk about what's normal, first of all. And when it comes to baby sleep, this is, I'm telling you, this is like something that threw me off. And I know it throws a lot of moms off because we all go walking around with our fingers on our, like right under our baby's noses, right? Or the hand on the chest, like, are you breathing? <laughs> because baby's breathing can be so interesting, like, especially with a newborn. So if you've ever held a newborn or you've been around a newborn or you talk about like, oh, sleeping like a baby. And we, there's a big joke about that, right? Because Babies don't necessarily sleep well, especially as they get older. But when they are newborns, those things, they can sleep through anything. And um, but also like how they sleep. So like I want to talk about their breathing just for a second, because they have these kind of like quick, shallow breaths where it's like this, like <sighs> and then like I I'm telling you, like I would worry all the time, like, is my baby alive? which is, I think is a very real concern for all moms with newborn babies, whether or not you're worried about SIDS or anything else. Like you just look at that baby and you're like, tell me you're alive. I'm just going to focus on you for a second. I'm going to put my finger under your nose. I'm going to put my hand on your chest. I just want to make sure that you're breathing because they look so relaxed and silent and all of that. So they, they kind of have this, they can have this like quick rapid breathing uh, that breathing can slow when they sleep. They can take rapid breaths and then pause breathing, which can be a little worrisome if you're a new mom. Um, and then like if you're baby wearing, you're constantly checking, or at least I was anytime I baby wore my babies, I was like, are you okay? Are you okay? Cause you hear those stories, which are few and far between, but of a mom that was baby wearing her baby and the setup wasn't right. And that chin got to the baby's chest or so, like something blocked an airway and they silently passed away. So constantly checking that. And then you've got the concern of SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome. And I actually want to talk about that just for a moment. When I was looking up information and I'm going to provide you guys a couple of links and some resources to check out within the show notes. But I looked up the CDC information because I was curious myself, like talk to me about numbers. How often are we seeing this? Like how big of a thing is it? What causes it? That kind of stuff. So they actually group in with SIDS. They call it sudden unexpected infant deaths. So S-U-I-D and SIDS being the highest. I think it, they said it accounts for like 40% of the deaths. And of course, I don't have that number directly in front of me, but I do have the link. Um, but they have like SIDS unknown causes and then accidental suffocation and strangulation in the bed, which don't stress about that because I'm going to tell you everything you need to do to make sure that doesn't happen during this episode. But it said in 2020, there were about 1,389 deaths due to SIDS, about 1,062 deaths to unknown, and about 905 deaths to accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed. 
So um, also looking at that, that means no. Yeah, that could have been correct with my percentages. Anyways, so as you're reading about that, there's uh, several things that can happen, right? As we're concerned about baby. So when we're talking about, for example, this sudden unexplained infant death or the sudden infant death syndrome, there's a couple of things that we can do to make sure that we are um, being safe and doing the best that we can. Just like with birth and pregnancy, there are going to be things that are out of your control. And we never like to hear that as parents, especially when we're trying to keep our little baby safe. So be aware of that. But there's, again, just like pregnancy and birth, a lot that we can control. So I want to talk to you about that for a moment. I pulled up some recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and I think all of them will make a lot of sense as I'm saying them out loud. But I think it's a really good idea to just have like a quick list for when you are home with a newborn and you are tired and that baby is just crying or you're like, I just need to get sleep or this baby just needs to sleep. So making sure that you've got like a quick list ready of I need to put my baby in this safe place. This is how I'm going to do it. Like it's already like preset, ready to go so that you don't have to worry about any of those um, kind of unexpected and unwanted circumstances. But they say... Baby on their back, especially if bed sharing, um, and especially if bed sharing, I kind of added that because if you're sharing a bed with your baby and that's different, like co-sleeping, they say is mom and baby in the same room. Bed sharing is just what it sounds like. Baby is in the bed with mom. You are sharing a bed, but I'll tell you, my bed is not going to be some flat thing. <laughs> that's really uncomfortable. Maybe firm is your thing, but even the firmest mattress, like adult mattress is not going to be as flat and level and stable as like a crib mattress is meant to be. So if you've got a baby that is more of a stomach sleeper, which I will tell you right now, my very first from the beginning as a newborn was like, do not put me on my back. And that was really hard for me. The only way he would sleep was on his stomach. So I would have to be really be paying attention and stuff. And then he slept great. But if your baby is a stomach sleeper, like for sure, if you're bed sharing, you want to be really careful and not have them on that like fluffier mattress or the loose sheets or any of that stuff. Um, and I mean, those who have bed shared and such before, you know, like you end up just kind of like snuggling on them or whatever anyways, like you're kind of all over the place. And there's some safety tips that go along with that too. But just just to, to stay on track here, <laughs> baby on the back, um, firm flat surface to sleep on kind of like I talked about difference between my mattress versus a crib mattress. Um, breastfeeding can actually encourage baby to not pass away suddenly. Like they say that babies that are breastfed, they experience the sudden infant death syndrome less. So that can be a positive, uh, sharing a room for the first six months. So kind of that co-sleeping with mom and or dad, but like somebody, an adult that can hear baby and you guys, I, I really think it has to be mom that they're like synced up with. Right. Cause that has to do with breastfeeding and bonding and all kinds of stuff and wake habits and, and all of that. But um, having mom in the room for the first six months, no toys in the baby's bed, um, offering pacifiers. They said after feeding has been established at night that that can help baby. Like they're keeping a suckling. Uh, it keeps them kind of like, yes, they're sleeping, but it is supposed to support that as well. Staying drug and alcohol free, avoid baby getting too hot because temperatures can definitely be a thing. Uh, vaccines, they say make sure that baby is scheduled and hits all of their vaccines. I think this is a hot topic and a very personal decision. I'm going to say that here. I think it's important that every parent has an opportunity to look into the vaccines, see how they feel about them, do the research, see how babies have done well or had um, maybe times when they didn't do so well and then make a decision for yourself. Avoid swaddling after they begin to roll over. Obviously that would be the same with a blanket and that's because then they can get themselves wrapped up in the fabric and not be able to get themselves out. So those are some things that can help avoid that. And then I kind of just as I was thinking about it, I'm like, I need to talk just for a minute, kind of like one mom to another. So those are American Academy of Pediatric Recommendations. I'm going to tell you, and obviously not medical advice. I don't mean it like this. This is like from one mom to another. You're going to, I don't know. Oh, now I'm going to have to find it. Um, there was, what is it? Like a real 
it was a reel or a t- and or a TikTok that was going around. It was basically a video and it was all of the advice that moms are given. And on the one hand, they're like, and you guys, many of you have probably seen this, but it was like, make sure that you um, hold your baby this, this often and do this to snuggle them. But also like, don't pick up your car seat because you can't pick up or they didn't say don't pick up your car seat, but don't lift this much weight for the first whatever. But also you need to take your baby to the pediatrician on this day. And then it's like breastfeed this long, but also don't do that. And it was just like this back and forth. My point is there's going to be a ton of information that you get as a mom, just like pregnancy and giving birth that it's two sided. It's opinionated in the best way where both sides are trying to tell you things because they think it is the best thing for you and your baby. Um, And there's going to be a point where you're going to have to make some decisions for yourself. And you're going to say, I'm going to have to do what feels right to me. Um, I can't worry so much that I can't function. That's kind of where I want to like step in and say, you know, um, I would even say pay attention to to how you're worrying. Is this turning into like anxiety? Am I having anxiety over this? Um, kind of these postpartum mood swings or whatever. I, I think, you know, something that could be easy if I was concerned about baby, like we had, um, we didn't have video monitors. We were not that cool, but we did have the sound monitors and just a way to like be checking on the baby or like here, put it close enough. Like, can I hear him breathing? Or if you've got the video, like, are they wrestling around? Like, are they doing okay? Checking on baby, that kind of thing. Um, I say keep baby with you often. And there's absolutely like, it's, I want you to understand too. Like it's okay. If you're like, I need a break from baby and I need them to nap and I need them to nap away from me so that I can have my own space so that I can sleep comfortably so that I can take a bath so that I can do some dishes. That is great. Um, the other side of that is it's okay to like, hang on to your baby. You're not going to spoil them. You can carry around them around with you everywhere. Um, I know some women even do like, it's called attachment parenting and that's like baby is with them at all times. Um, so this is just where we get to choose what works for us, what our intuition is telling us and how we want to parent. I'd say along with that, I would add in postpartum positive affirmations and prayer. If you're a religious person or meditation, maybe if you're more spiritual, however that looks for you, but making sure that you are still after pregnancy and birth is over, adding in those positive affirmations. Like I am a good mother. I am the mother for my baby. I'm the right mother for my baby. Um, I have the ability to take care of my baby exactly how they need. And just all of those things that you could think that you have the fears of, you can still use that positive affirmation exercise. Any of those fears, move it into a positive affirmation. And then too, if you are feeling concerned about your baby, like great. That's why you have a pediatrician and a pediatrician that you have hopefully chosen while you were pregnant or, um, before you've given birth. And that way you can kind of like roll into that next relationship. Also, it's okay to change your pediatrician, just like it was okay to change your OB. So keep that in mind. I would say when you're looking for one, um, you want, you want somebody that's going to be supportive, just like your OB should have been. (laughs) Um, and I think it's good to know that pediatricians, have dealt with a lot of new moms before, like they are the first contact for new moms. So I want to encourage you to ask all the questions and not be ashamed or feel crazy or think that anything sounds stupid. The whole point is that we have the support system that we can lean on and use and get the help that we need. If for some reason your pediatrician is rude or condescending or shamed, Um, or shaming you in any way, great. You like get to move on to another one, interview another one, get some, some time with a different pediatrician, find one that works for you. Um, for example, and I know vaccines are a hot topic, so that's something to talk about, but if you don't want to do all the vaccines for your baby, or you just want to do a certain amount, or you want to spread them out or have them on a different schedule and, and you are asking questions, for example, to make an informed decision. So like, this is what you're hoping to do with your baby. And you're asking your pediatrician questions and you're not getting what you need in return, or, um, you're getting some kind of rude behavior, or I can't deal with you if you're not going to vaccinate your baby. This is a serious conversation I had. Cause I don't know if you guys remember, I've shared it on this podcast before, but after I had my first baby, I chose not to get the hep B vaccine with my baby. 
And the pediatrician that was going to do my baby circumcision was like, I like, you're so irresponsible. I can't believe you would do that. And just like railed into me and then said, and I can't be a pediatrician if you're going to choose to, you know, do this and not be safe and all that. And I'm like, okay, I just, you know, I just gave birth. Give me a break. So anyways, all of that to say, if you're having issues with these kind of hot topics, you're feeling judged instead of informed and that they want to be more in charge of the healthcare of your child than you, then that's time to find a new pediatrician, obviously, right? This would be the same thing, um, issues like breastfeeding or weight gain or anything like that. Okay, let me talk for a minute. I know I mentioned co-sleeping and bed sharing. So let me talk about how they are a little bit different. Uh, just like I said before, co-sleeping is when the baby is in the same room with mom. Bed sharing is when baby is in the same bed with mom. Now, benefits are a ton. Uh, so even if you can't have baby in your bed, which maybe some of that is comfort, maybe that is your um, birth partner or significant other, maybe there is, you know, one of you smokes or there's drugs and alcohol or, you know, there's other reasons like even and I'm as I'm saying drugs and alcohol, I'm not talking about recreational drugs and things, which would obviously be its own issue. I mean, like there's medication because somebody's hurt or something provided all of those things are not around, then there are actually some really great benefits um, to having your baby in your room with you and even on skin with you as you sleep. So breastfeeding would be probably one of the number one, like up there with bonding, because the closer that you guys can be obvious, like this baby has grown inside of your belly for the last nine months. They're super close to you. And I mean, your sleep patterns match each other. I can't find the study, but I remember learning about it as, um, as I was becoming a childbirth educator and they talked about a study. So if you are listening and you are like a, a birth educator or a doula or a birth professional birth worker, and you know, this study, please, holy cow, <laughs> email me at hello at my essential birth.com because I am looking for it and can't find it. But I remember them talking about this study and I think it stuck with me because it was so interesting that it talked about the baby's wave brain wave patterns matching the moms as they slept. And so they were, they, they had them like hooked up so that they could see. And even the dream patterns, like you can obviously can't see what they're dreaming about, but like literally whatever mom's brain waves were doing, babies was doing it with them. And I thought that's so interesting because why wouldn't you be that connected after growing this baby in your belly, it makes sense that you guys would be that connected. Um, so obviously we've got some breastfeeding establishment, some bonding that's going to be really good. I think it's really great for sleep for mom and baby. Baby's going to sleep better. Mom's going to sleep better. And then you're really attuned to like when baby's getting hungry because it's not just that you're hearing some noises and then all of a sudden you're like, OK, I got to wake up and get the baby out of the crib or go to the other room and grab the baby out of the crib. Um, and get ready to nurse or give them a bottle. It's like you start feeling the wrestling around before we even hear anything. And so I will tell you, it was like my favorite thing in the world to be like, baby's hungry. I'm just going to pull out my boob and, and then we can both go back to sleep. I for sure have fallen asleep with a baby on my boob more than once. Um, and then the best part about that too, like I remember with my first, I was, and we were bed sharing and so I was like, okay, baby on the left side. And then I would have to like hold the baby up and roll him over to my other side and like hold him on that side really careful while I was nursing. And I think after a couple months and I know other moms, it, you're just like, I'm just going to lift my arm over instead. So baby's nursing on the left. Now they're going to get the right boob because I'm just going to turn my body a little, <laughs> put my hand over the side and, and nurse them that way. I got so much more sleep doing it that way. In fact, when we brought my first baby home, we were like, okay, we're going to be really careful about this. And I got one of those. It's like a, it's like a co-sleeper and I can't remember the name of it, but it was basically this, like their own little personal bed thing that went in between my husband and I on the bed. So it laid like kind of flat with the bed, but it had these little like bumpers. So baby had their own space. Baby didn't like it. I didn't like it. It took up too much space. We had a queen size bed. 
just all the things. Um, and so once I started just having baby right next to me, it became a lot easier. Uh, but, and two, I think it's awesome when you're sharing with your baby. Cause you're like, Oh, my baby smells so good. Oh, I get to cuddle them and have them right next to you. Like I am somebody that loves, loves, loves the newborn stage. I love my newborn babies. It is harder for me when they hit toddler because they are, or not even just toddler, but like once they're mobile and running away from you or in my son's case, like rolling as fast as he can to get away from me. Um, that is harder for me, but I am like, give me all the newborn snuggles. So if that's you, like I loved sleeping with my babies. Now, of course, there's going to be some risks with that. Kind of what I talked about before, any kind of drug use or anything like that. If there's loose blankets, um, if there's, um, just any, any kind of like outside stuff that I talked about where like the sheets aren't tight, the bed's not tight. Um, you're maybe not all there or aware that kind of stuff. That's absolutely, those can be an, a risk, but I also want you to know that it is very normal and natural to want to be near your baby, to be sleeping with your baby, to have them co-sleeping in the room. All of that is like, and it's more normal and natural for the baby. They're going to want to be close to mom. And that's what's comforting to them. As many of you know, like even trying to pass them off to dad, it's like, no, I want mom's smell and mom's heartbreak and mom's skin. Um, so keep all of that in mind. And then remember too, because it's just part of it, there's going to be judgment no matter what you do. So you might as well do what feels right for you. And just like pregnancy and birth brings its own, like you tell somebody you're going to go unmedicated or you're going to have a home birth or I mean, any number of things I want to do delayed cord clamping and everyone has an opinion. And so it's just going to come back to what is my intuition telling me? How do I feel about the situation? And do I, you know, am I going to trust how um, the information that I've got looked over the benefits and risks and trust how I feel about it and not have to worry about what my mom says, what my you know, whatever. So I think just handing that back to you as moms and just knowing like it's normal to question a lot of what we do. It is very normal and it's okay to trust yourself as well. So do what's right for you. I think is kind of my big thing there. Um, I kind of mentioned it, but like you can't spoil your baby by holding them too much. That's not a real thing. I remember early on, people were telling me like, do the cry it out. And they, they just need to know how to self-soothe. That's how they say it, right? Like baby just needs to figure out how to self-soothe. And I'm like, I just remember like there was one time especially where I was like, I'm just going to let him cry. And I let him cry so long. Like it still makes me upset to this day. He fell asleep. This was my oldest. Gosh, he was like five months old because he was sitting up already and he had his head up against the crib. He fell asleep crying like that. I like came in and I took a picture. I still have that picture. And I'm like, yeah, I don't ever want to forget that. And I don't ever want that to happen again. I think when babies are young, self-soothing, I mean, they've been with you this whole time and it's scary to be apart and they're little and they can't communicate the way that you and I communicate. And so it's just a little trickier. So that's my take on it. Um, I, there are all kinds of rules of thought and stuff, but I did want to say like, you're not going to spoil your baby. You're not going to make them more needy. And I can tell you that because I for sure have lived this now a couple of times. Um, and the more time I spent with him, I felt actually like the more chill, those kids were the more grounded, the, the better they self soothed actually like on their own. I don't know. So that's my take on it. That's my personal take on it. Um, also reminding you to take a break when you need it and ask your partner for help. Because as I'm saying all of this, I don't want anybody to feel like, okay, I can't spoil my baby. So they're supposed to be with me all the time, which is not what I'm saying in case that's what you're worried about. But also to like, I don't want you to feel guilty for having to put your baby down and walk away and say, I need a break and you're going to cry for a little bit. And I, it's fine. Like I'm okay. And you're okay. Um, even when we're talking about things like shaken baby syndrome, for example, a lot of that just comes from the frustration of like, I can't fix this for you. And I'm overwhelmed and overworked. And my mind is just, it's too much. And I'm trying to do too much. And then that frustration comes out physically, which is so sad. And of course, 
I, I would say like these moms, like that's not their initial intention to shake their baby. So when you're noticing that you hit that point of like mental, emotional exhaustion and you need a break from this sweet little baby that probably doesn't seem so sweet in that moment, um, make sure you put them flat on their back in a safe place and where you can like walk out, close the door, walk away. And if possible, right? Like whoever your partner is like, Hey, I need to have space away from this sweet baby and that crying for a bit. And I need to walk outside and be away for a moment. Um, give yourself the opportunity to do that. Um, before like notice it before it becomes an issue because it's very real. That baby can take over a lot of our mental space and a lot of our emotions and we're tired early on. So make sure that you're giving yourself a break and asking your partner for help. All right, let's talk about baby waking just for a minute. Um, when they are closer to you, it's going to be more natural. So, um, with their sleeping at night, as well as during the day, the closer that they are to you, they'll kind of form their own window. So it might not look like what you're expecting it to look like. For example, when you're in a hospital setting and they say, you need to wake up your baby every two hours to feed. Well, maybe your baby just nursed and 45 minutes later, they want to nurse again. And you're like, but you need two hours and, or they're not sleeping two hours or they're sleeping four hour stretches. And you're like, I'm supposed to wake my baby. Um, there's, I think once, if you have your baby close to you and more often, um, you'll just kind of get a rhythm of it. It will happen naturally. And following that rhythm is great and will be good. You know, as long as baby's hitting milestones, they have enough poopies and wet diapers, they're nursing enough, that kind of stuff. I'm also going to tell you as one mom to another, make noise around your newborns. This is not something I was super great at. Like when we brought my first baby home, I was like, everybody be quiet and be quiet all the time. And certainly like in the beginning, it's not like every little noise woke my newborn because they really do sleep pretty heavily. But as the months went on, I was like, oh my gosh, like we had a pool nearby and I would just get so angry. Like, oh my gosh, they're splashing too loud. Like they're going to wake the baby and I need a break. And uh, the more noise you can do around your baby, the better. And I didn't really have a choice when I had my second um, because my first baby was making a ton of noise. My, I had a little toddler and running around or we have the TV on. I remember somebody telling me early on, like vacuum around your baby, play music, let the kids run around. And seriously, especially with a newborn, I feel like that works great. I know people use white noise machines and fans and whatever else for when baby's sleeping. And that's an option too. It does drown out background noise and things. Um, and some women love that idea. Other people are, you know, opinionated about why you shouldn't use those things. Um, but that that's definitely an option. I will just tell you though, like the biggest problem I have is once my older kids are old enough to go in and wake up the baby. And then I'm like, Oh, it is on. <laughs> uh, but by that time I'm, you know, missing out on all kinds of naps and sleep and, and all of that. But I think, I think that's awesome to just kind of have that perspective. Cause I remember like quite literally having panic attacks, thinking about my babies being woken up. Like if somebody rang the doorbell, Oh, heaven help you, you better run. Because if my baby wakes up from that, it's going to be a whole other issue. So here's another question. Should I wake my baby to nurse? And this is a huge, big question. And there are all kinds of schools of thought. Again, if you're coming from a hospital setting, they're going to tell you, yes, always wake your babies to nurse. Uh, also, some women are just going to feel more comfortable waking their babies to nurse. So again, this is personal and you can choose to do that. The Lecce League has an article. I'm going to include it as well. Um, and they were talking about the most recent research and they said, it actually shows that waking your baby to nurse can decrease supply and listening to your baby's cues is a much better way. So especially when you're worried about breastfeeding supply and things like that um, or anything, you know, involved with sleeping and breastfeeding. And it's not to say that you can't wake a baby on a schedule and still maintain good supply and such. But I think the issue becomes just kind of like I talked about, like you wait, you you nurse your baby and as a newborn baby, maybe they're hungry before two hours, but then you're like, Oh, I got to wait. Cause it hasn't been the two hours. Um, or, you know, they're sleeping too long and, uh, and, or you're not around them when that arousal is happening. And so those 
early cues are getting missed and then you're into the crying stage. And then when they're crying, it can be really hard to get them attached. And then they're tired from all the crying. So they're not getting enough milk and then they're falling back asleep. It can cause issues sometimes. So and moms that have had a couple babies, like you've been here, you get it. It becomes kind of this normal, natural process that we do. But in the beginning, and for a first time mom especially, it can be a bit a bit tricky. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, but when you are, again, around your baby and you're following those cues, that is like that the cues are the key. And this is something that I will tell you right now, I was not good at it as a first time mom. So just be aware of that. Uh So let me give you a couple ideas like here's how to tell if your baby's getting enough. First of all, you're going to watch for the baby's cues. Crying is a late cue. So think of like if you haven't had a baby, then this is going to be a little trickier. But maybe you've been around newborn babies um, or maybe you've had a baby before. Like, you know, as a mom that crying is a pretty late cue. So the earlier cues that you're looking for are like, they've got their eyes fluttering a little bit. They've, their mouth is moving, especially like in a nur- nursing pattern like that. Um, Cause you can see me through the microphone. Hands are coming towards their mouth. Like, you know how they like put their fists towards their mouth and like it'll hit their mouth and they turn their, their head to like go towards their hand. Those are all early cues. If you start nursing at those cues, baby's going to be happy and satisfied. Um, and, but, and it can throw you off if you're like, but I just nursed you 30 minutes ago. Um, why are you doing that? You can't be hungry again, but they actually can't. They're so fun. Uh, and then there's like the less subtle cues that are, they're turning their head side to side. They're whimpering. They're kind of making those like squeaking noises. And again, I'm going to give you guys the article because a lot of this comes from the Lechi League in this article. Uh, but then and then you've got the late cues, like when you hit the crying or the faster breathing or the baby's becoming tense. All of that is more of those late cues. And it means, uh oh, we actually missed something a little bit back here. So I think, like I said, the tricky part is working on making sure that they get enough of what they need, meaning they've got enough poopy diapers. They've got enough wet diapers. They are gaining appropriate weight for their age and size. All of that is those are really good cues that things are moving in the right direction and you don't have to necessarily stick to a schedule. The other thing on that, which I know I've said this on a podcast before with another IBCLC is you don't have to burp your babies, which is another thing that can kind of pause them from being able to go straight to sleep. Uh, Obviously, if your baby needs to be burped, you will know and you can. And that's totally great. If you don't have to, well, then don't. You don't have to force a burp out of your baby. Sometimes there's air bubbles and it's needed and other times they are just fine. So I think paying attention to the cues, um, reminding yourself that like, even if you're hearing in your head, but I just fed you, (laughs) that if the cues are telling you that there's something there to go off of that. Also remember that like cluster feeding or needing to nurse a lot, um, a lot of that happens early. Well, cluster feeding can happen kind of at some different locations or different timelines, but those early, like my baby's nursing all the time and I'm not getting any sleep and all of that. They're just establishing things. And there's a lot other reasons, a lot of other reasons rather than just I'm hungry that a baby nurses talk about self-soothing like that's a way that they soothe that can be a bonding thing that can be I just feel like nursing um I'm lonely I'm scared like all the emotions that you can think of there's a bunch of reasons that babies nurse they just like being close to mom so keep that in mind too like it's not always about food production and eating sometimes it's like what a baby would use a pacifier for like it's to pacify themselves so Those are some tips on baby sleep, baby waking, baby nursing, all that kind of stuff. And I can't wait, you guys. This postpartum program is going to be so good. This is just a minor snippet uh, from one of the classes. And I guess I will see you next week.